So again, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, earlier this week, I had a uh, conversation with a member. Um, and I asked them, uh, you know, where, 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 you know, where, where is kind of where, where are you having the most difficulty in your practice? You know, where are you most challenged? And she said, well, she said, I'm really working on uh, cultivating acceptance, cultivating loving kindness, uh, but I'm having a real problem. She said with uh, <laughs> with a lot of our, uh, you know political leaders. She said, I, I understand kind of intellectually, you know, wishing them, you know, not wanting anyone to suffer, uh, basically wanting everyone to be happy. I understand that. Uh, but she says, when it comes to certain individuals who I clearly uh, perceive as doing harm, uh, she said, I'll be honest with you, I just don't feel it. And that's where I feel my practice is lacking. <laughs> and so uh, I thought that was interesting. Uh, and I really acknowledged to her that I thought she was doing fine. You know, There is in all these practices, there's theory and practice. There's the ideal and the real. And, uh, you know, what we want to do is be able to integrate. And so, as you know, uh, reality is not the same as theory. And the ideal uh, doesn't often uh, clearly uh, show us how to apply practically. <laughs> That is the uh, creativity of it. Uh, and I acknowledge to her, you know, very clearly that while we are called uh, not to hate, while we are called uh, to be understanding, but to be compassionate, to know that uh, uh, everyone is suffering in their own way. When we are called to wish uh, happiness for everyone, we know that if people truly had happiness, uh, a lot of or mostly all their reasons uh, for doing harm uh, to other human beings or to themselves uh, would not be present. That is our ideal. That is our vision. And yet we live, all of us, in the real. <laughs> uh, we live in real time. And in real time, uh, you know, there are people out of their fear, out of their ignorance, out of their greed, anger, delusion, who are doing harm, right? who are doing harm uh, uh, to, to other human beings who are doing harm to the planet, who are doing harm to future generations, right? And, and, um, and so this person was asking, well, aren't I supposed to love them? <laughs> and I said, no, you're not supposed to love them. This is not like falling in love. This is not an emotional thing. Right? There are many people in this world who are not lovable as they are. But that's not doesn't mean that we can't understand them, that we can't accept, that we cannot not accept them as they are. Uh, and that we want to help them. 
And I think, you know, on our cushion, on our, on our meditations, we are learning to cultivate this deep, wholesome uh, energy of loving kindness and compassion. Because it, it, is, it is the answer. It is the, is the answer for us, and it's the answer ultimately for the world. Because it comes from all that is wholesome, and the energy of that wants to do good, wants to protect, wants to end suffering of beings, you see? So it's a, it's a wonderful energy. And so we need to learn to cultivate it. And, and oftentimes we first learn how to cultivate things kind of in ideal situations, you know, such as when we're together and we're meditating together or when we're on our cushion and then et cetera. Um, and so that's good because for many of us, uh, we don't have enough of that kind of energy. That is not the energy that connects us uh, to the world. Because often the energy that connects us to the world is the world of self. And even though uh, Buddhism clearly uh, states that ultimately there is no solid permanent thing called a self, yet in most human beings, the self manifests as a, as a, as a, as a constructed thing. What is it constructed of? Words. And so it is the construction of the self, which is ultimately all about its ideas of who it is and who it isn't, what it likes and what it doesn't like, what it believes, what it doesn't believe, what it prefers, what it doesn't prefer, all its, all its ideologies, all its, you know, it, it, that's, that is the con construct. And everybody has that. Some have very simple ones, some have very elaborate ones. But that is the construct that self identifies with as me. And so since most people enter the world with that construct, con constantly fil uh, filtering, constantly scanning, constantly interpreting experience, it is endlessly uh, in conflict with reality. And one of the ways uh, when it perceives something uh, that is in opposition or somehow is preventing the construct of self from fulfilling what it thinks it needs or wants, it, it reacts, reacts with fear. It's afraid it's going to get what it doesn't want. It's afraid it's not going to get what it wants. It gets irritated, it gets angry. You know, even the smallest things, we, we don't realize why do we get angry when we're caught in traffic or something? Because we have a construct that's all about me getting to where I want to go or a construct of how things should be unfolding or how I should be dry or how other people should be driving. We don't realize that construct is constantly meeting the world. And when that construct, which is small mind created, perceives something that is any way interfering with that, again, fear, anger, sadness, despair arises where? In the same mind that created the construct. So it is a constant internal process that is constantly generating lots of disharmony inside us, right? because we are endlessly meeting the world through the construct of self, which means these endless thoughts, beliefs, attitudes, clingings. So when we learn to cultivate something that is non-self, that is not based on situational, such as, you know, the heart of love, that just radiates like the sun, the heart of compassion, which just radiates like the sun. The sun has no constructs. The sun just shines. 
It shines on everyone. It shines on everything. <laughs> it shines on living things and it shines on inanimate things. It doesn't, it, it just shines. Uh, and so that's the idea. And that's what we practice and that's what we cultivate. And that's what we want to bring to the world and that's what we also want to bring to ourselves because it it gets us out of the narrowness and constricted self, self, which is always nickel and diming, always parsing, always weighing, always endlessly bifurcating between loving and hating and liking and disliking and accepting and non-accepting. <laughs> you know? Uh, it's the endless, endless, endless process. So we want to kind of get to some fundamental principles that come from a deeper place within us and that are places that are fundamentally wholesome and harmonious. So when they come forward, it not only is beneficial for us, but it is beneficial for others because, because we're a person too. So if something is beneficial for us, in, 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 in our experience of it, it's also beneficial for other human beings and vice versa. So it's very clear what is wholesome and unwholesome. So I'm circling back to uh, the current situation. And then I was talking uh, to somebody uh, who was talking to me about young people they're in contact with, uh, college age kids, whatever, and just saying how, uh, you know, how distressed they were by the current situation. Uh, uh, I'm sure many of you know there was a debate <laughs> earlier this week. Uh, I personally, even though I was encouraged to watch it, had no interest in watching it. Why didn't I have any interest in watching it? Because I knew it would only cultivate, it would only touch negative seeds in me. <laughs> and I don't need to go out of my way to uh, nourish negative seeds or stimulate negative seeds. Uh, I mean, I didn't know what actually I heard unfolded, but uh, I knew even at its best, I would be frustrated by, you know, the lack of, in, in, you know, the lack of intelligence, the lack of depth, sound bites. I mean, it was, so uh, <laughs> I chose to pass on it. But uh, uh, I'm trying to give up unless, I'm, unless I think some good will come from it. Cultivating negativity. See things, situations, media that cultivate negative mind states. Don't bring out the best. Uh, uh, but what this person was saying that you know, you know, many uh, young people were very upset by it. They were upset that uh, you know to see two adults, uh, you know, who were vying, uh, you know, quote unquote, the highest office in the land to be our leaders, uh, you know in a certain way where, and I'm not saying who was right, who was wrong, who did it more, who did it less, but they, they seem to think that both of them uh, seem to be in certain way uh, acting fairly immature. And it disturbed them that uh, when they perceive their adults or leaders sort of uh, acting uh, worse than they do, talking to each other worse than they talk to each other. You know, so it was very disheartening and, uh, and uh, you know, just breeds this sense of mistrust. And then I was surprised when the, this person said, and they also, uh, they don't even believe that uh, our president is really sick. I said, what? No, no, they think it's just a publicity stunt to get sympathy. Now, again, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I thought, wow, we have come to this in our, in our culture, in our society. You know, it's a very, uh, it's a very disheartening moment, isn't it? When you can't even believe people. 
uh, and if you can't believe the people who are at least you're supposed to believe that they're somewhat honest, they're somewhat direct, they're somewhat grounded in reality, uh, it's a very difficult time. And to me, that really speaks to, uh, you know, it speaks to Dharma. It speaks to all the things we do. Because one of the things we do is learn to develop an internal place of solidity and peace and stability within ourselves and clarity. It is from this place that we enter the world. But we need to be here first. So especially in a world where there seems to be such instability, there seems to be so much conflict, there seems to be so much confusion about what's true or not. It's very important that we be grounded. That we know the truth of our own being. We know the truth of our own values. We know the truth of our own clarity and the truth of, the, of our own way we want to show up in the world, that that's, that's our fundamental truth. And that is our fundamental responsibility to enter the world, whatever way it's going, from that perspective. If we don't have that, then it's very easy to get lost. And when we get lost, it's very easy then to be taken over by fear and confusion and despair and sadness and anger and rage, which then do what? Which often cloud the mind even more. And then sabotage our capacity to enter the world from a place of wholesomeness, from a place of understanding, from a place of compassion, from a place of caring. Because we want, you know, we want to care for the world. You know, our, our thrust is to care for the world, to want the best for the world, to want the best for everyone. Especially when we see in this polarity that you know, there is this uh, suffering and delusion, you know, on all sides. And then somebody was asking me this week, but when we see what's going on in the world and when we see people see very consciously uh, doing harm or very consciously spreading lies or very consciously uh, spreading uh, disinformation, which can create harm to other beings, is it, is it totally wrong to be angry, right? It's very interesting. Because Buddhism, you know, as we know, has a lot to say about anger. <laughs> We've certainly said a lot here about anger. Uh, so I think it's a very important point. And to understand, in Mahayana Buddhism, there is a place for anger. It's called um, compassionate anger, for want of a better word. Which is diff different than egoic anger. Uh, because our typical egoic anger is the anger uh, when the self and its constructs perceive that world people situations are not proceeding according to its agenda, it gets angry. And that anger is directed at whoever we perceive as the one who is not doing or acting the way we want. So it's very personal. And it turns the other, and this could be whether it's people you live with or it could be, you know, national figures, it's always the same. We diminish the other by turning them into an enemy. And when we create an enemy, we perceive a person that we really uh, 
don't wish the best for. <laughs> uh, we wish harm for, and we diminish them as a human being, which, which then totally prevents any type of clarity or compassion or understanding uh, to arise, because that type of anger is very disturbing. And it is a klesha, it is a covering. So that kind of anger, which is directed at the person, uh, is, is what Buddhism says, this is not a good anger. It disturbs the mind's clarity, equanimity, it prevents one from responding intelligently, compassionately, or understanding. It is to be uprooted. But then people say, well, but what about, you know, can't you get angry at injustice? <laughs> can't you get angry at uh, people who are consciously uh, are doing harm and, and, and spreading disinformation and lies or going very consciously trying to create confusion? And I said, well, of course you can. But it's a different kind of anger. The other anger is, is ego anger, it's self-anger, it's personal anger. And it's anger that, that, that has self-righteousness over here and utter wrongness and badness over there. It's dualistic. But if you think about compassion, right, which is again, as I said earlier, one of these fundamental ways we enter the world. Compassion means in Buddhism, I want to alleviate or end the suffering. Right? So, when we perceive someone is doing harm, in other words, someone is creating and perpetuating suffering, That kind of compassionate anger, which is a sense that this is wrong, harm is being done, because it acknowledges the whole. The other anger is like me against you. But this comes from a very different place. This is like an injury to the whole. This is doing harm to the whole. This is doing harm both to the victim and to the perpetrator. I mean, like take climate. I mean, we're all in this. <laughs> we're all gonna, we're all gonna, uh, you know, uh, you know, we all are gonna create. Uh, we all are gonna uh, uh, experience the effects of it. It affects the whole, right? Uh, injustice affects the whole because it, it diminishes everyone and it creates great suffering within the whole community. It prevents the community of human beings being whole, being connected, acting to each other in a noble, caring way. So, so situations are people who do harm to that, who try to separate people into the good and the bad you know, the right and the wrong, the high and the low, the, the worthy and the unworthy, they do harm. They create suffering. And so that kind of anger in response to when we uh, see someone consciously doing harm is not, an, is not a, it's not the emotion of anger. How can I explain it to you? It's a different emotion. It kind of looks the same, and in the immediacy of it, it can, it can, in the hit of it, it could feel the same. But the other anger, the egoic anger, just keeps spinning. It just keeps intensifying. It just keeps going round and round and round, getting stronger, stronger, stronger. And it, and it usually creates in the other that it's directed to more negativity. Well, this other type of anger, 
compassionate anger, anger that is, that is in relationship to protecting the whole, does not go down that road. The, the anger, let's say, at injustice or the anger at uh, corruption or at all this is, a, is an anger that can kind of wake us up and can mobilize energy, but it moves very quickly into compassionate action. What can I do to protect the whole? Which, which then becomes... How do I protect the people who are the victims of, but how do I protect the perpetrators from creating more harm? I want to protect them from continuing to do what they do. It's a, it's a compassion that wants the benefit of the whole. It understands that we're all in this together. And that the immediate, uh, you know, you're right, you're wrong, you're good, you're bad, I'm on your side, let's get them. Is just this endless spiral, this endless circle. And that is true whether it's in society or whether it's true within our own family and our own relations. It's the same exact issue. In families. Sometimes parents might get angry with their children's behavior, <laughs> but they still love them. And even if they act, have to act somewhat decisively or strongly or firmly, it is only to protect, you know, it's only to protect. Sometimes people get angry at their uh, partners and spouses and significant, ang you know, others. Egoic anger continues, and it turns the other into the enemy, to an object, it diminishes them, it dehumanizes them, right? But when anger is acknowledged simply as, a, as an acknowledgement that whatever occurring is in the moment breaking apart the whole, creating disconnection, and then the, the energy is directed toward what can I do in this situation, even most, again, even in the most intimate of relations, to restore wholeness, to restore goodness, to restore understanding. So this, I think, is very important because, um, you know, again, there's nothing absolute. You know, we have the ideal, but the ideal then has to be applied in reality. And so, and this is where we practice, you know, we don't, you know, we don't, people who practice their spiritual life in an alternative universe, you know, have a lot of problems uh, in daily life. There are many people who are quite uh, so-called spiritual, religious, uh, who do very well within their own confines of spirituality and religion. But when they get into the reality of, of reality and relationships and really sort of begin to mix it up in life, uh, their uh, ideals uh, and their kind of alternate universe uh, spirituality uh, usually doesn't work very well. So we want, uh, you know, we want to be able to have our, our spirituality, our dharma, uh, able to enter the world. And when we enter the world and apply it, you know, it's, it's, it's not pure anymore. And so I think the challenge is how do I take what is pure and bring it into reality where I know it's going to get a little dirty, <laughs> but just not very dirty. As we, as we work. We've, we work with ourselves in terms of our own healing and transformation, where we work most importantly with those in our, that we are in relationship with, because that is something where the, the transformative power is much more accessible. 
but also again, how we, how we deal with this world, which is more and more presenting challenges to us. I mean, if, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, <laughs> you know, the, the, the greatest uh, salespeople for the impermanent, uh, insubstantial, ever-changing, contradictory uh, capacity of human beings to create suffering for each other. And, you know, you know, it's like, just, just tune in daily. <laughs> almost. The world is presenting us with all the reasons we need to practice, to want to wake up, to want to be free, to want to be people who can enter the world and really be of benefit to it and not perpetuate the, uh, you know, the delusion and the ignorance. But again, we have to be clear. You know, if you're, somebody was telling me the other day about how, uh, you know, a lot of these sites, uh, you know, like Amazon or whatever, you go in to buy something and all of a sudden you get, if you like this or all these other things pop up and they were saying, you know, that they heard somewhere, read somewhere, you know, that this is all uh, manipulative, that, that they have engineers know exactly who we are, exactly our history of likes and dislikes and preferences. And so everything that's popping up that they're saying, you know, is something you'd be interested in. It's not random that they, they're actually there. You know, they have a good file on each of us and they are just trying to manipulate us to buy. And what I said was, you know, since I do sh sometimes shop on those sites, he said, you know, I have no problem with that because I'm not interested in any of that. <laughs> you know, when I go into a site, I know what I want to buy and I, and I buy it. And I see all these other things pop up and there's no interest, there's no attention, there's no energy. And I think, and I think that, is, that is the benefit of practice. That is the benefit of having a mind uh, you know, that is fairly free and open and aware and can just let things arise. But in terms of movement, the, the mind moves from a place of value and meaning and not just from reactivity or, you know, there it is and I got to grab onto it. And, and again, I think that's very important, uh, you know, with it, when I heard this, like, I mean, again, I mean, I could be naive, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but when I saw something about, you know, the president uh, has COVID and he's been hospitalized and the doctor says he does, I mean, they may be fudging around how well he's doing. You know, I sort of naively believe <laughs> that's true. So I was quite surprised to go, well, there's a whole sector of the population that doesn't even believe that. Right? You know, I think get angry. It's all just more of this manipulation. I, I, I don't know. So, but again, that may be, you know, from a, from a Buddhist point of view, the appearance of delusion, the appearance of all kinds of things in the world by causes and conditions is just the nature of this world. Things are just arising and passing. And the, the fundamental stance of Buddhists in terms of what they perceive and especially in terms of what they uh, think about something, is always to ask, is it true? I mean, that's like fundamental. Is it true? And the answer usually is uh, to is it true is, uh, you know, I don't really know. Right? So it's always conditional. Even to say it appears to be, or they're telling me is. But in my mind, it's like, well, that could be, but it may not be true. So that gives you some ability to navigate the world and not be sucked in. And again, I th it sounds like what many of us, uh, again, I don't because I don't, I don't participate in social media, but I know mostly everybody does. It's, you know, you know, you have to have your wits about you. You, know, you have to know what you're doing. And you have to be, you have to enter it knowing that you're entering an environment that is totally manipulative, that they're just trying to distract you endlessly, and they're using emotionality to do it. And if you're not clear, if you don't have clarity in your mind, if you don't have stability, if you're not grounded, 
again, it is very difficult not just to be swept away. And, uh, you know, this was a challenge that the ancient uh, practitioners did not have when they developed their teachings. They had no idea <laughs> what things were going to look like. And, uh, you know, to me, on a practical basis, it makes, it makes the, you know, the teachings of mindfulness and presence and right thinking and is it true and good values, and, you know, even more important than ever. Because the environment is so, uh, so, so stimulating with things that are stimulating uh, unwholesomeness in people. So I think it's uh, very important that we understand that our uh, practice of Dharma, our practice of meditation and mindfulness are not just add-ons, not just, you know, bringing benefit over here. I think they are becoming more and more a necessity uh, to survive with some degree of sanity and clarity uh, and positiveness in, uh, in, in this age. Uh, that we are living in. I think again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I mean, it disturbs me that so many people wake up in the morning and the first things they do is they start polluting their minds. You know, they're checking their this, they're checking their that, they're checking the news. Already they're getting, they're watering negative seeds. They're stimulating agitation in the mind. It is important that we have boundaries, you know, on when we turn on, you know, when we turn on the external world, <laughs> uh, which is not a real world, it's it's a, it's, it's it's a world that's being fed to us, uh, you know, and that we spend a good bit of time grounding ourselves in our present moment reality. That we get up in the morning, we set our intentions for the day while we're still in bed or while we're just feet are touching the ground. We go to the bathroom with mindfulness. If we go, whatever we do next, we go in the kitchen, make tea or coffee, we do it with mindfulness. We spend some time just enjoying and being present to what we're doing. That we spend some time meditating, just cultivating groundedness, mindfulness, clarity, to some degree or another in our minds. And have real, parameters around, you know, at what time you click it on. Uh, because it's just endlessly stimulating, and we all know that. And please do not think that, you know, most people are not capable of going in into their, uh, you know, their electronic devices for one thing, because as soon as you're in there for one thing, 20 other things will pop up, and before you know it, you're off and running. And you don't even know how you got there. You know, it's, it's, it's really, <laughs> it's almost like a mirror for our deluded mind. You know what I mean? We're, we're, we're sitting down, we're going to meditate. And before we know, we find ourselves off in some dreamland, you know? And we don't even know how we got here, right? It's like driving distracted, you know? It's all of a sudden you realize, sure, I've been driving for the last 10 minutes and have not been paying attention. Luckily, the, the part of us that has been paying attention, that is very clear. That is the, that is the good part of us has never taken its eye off the, uh, off, the <laughs> off the wheel. But the rest of our mind has just kind of wandered off. It's, it's, it's bizarre. So again, we don't need, you know, so most people are used to doing that just for themselves. But now we have these devices in which we have the devices can do it for us. Right? They can just take us on this random, ever unfolding, one thing leading to another, you know, and we don't even know how, how we got there, where we ended up. Didn't I come on here 20 minutes ago to just look up this one thing? <laughs> you know, and it's, so it's, just, it's, it's really amazing how it's replicated the distracted mind. You know, the monkey mind that just jumps around from one thing to another. Monkey see, monkey do. This looks interesting. That looks interesting. Jumps here, jumps there. I mean, it's, it's really just a, a paradigm of the deluded monkey mind. Except so now we can have a monkey mind inside and we can, you know, have a monkey mind outside. It's like complete monkeyness. <laughs> Which is, you know, humorous from one side and perhaps tragic on another since we, you know, most of us don't aspire to be monkeys. You know, nothing against monkeys. But, uh, 
you know, we, we have greater capacities. So anyhow, uh, I want to, let me stop there. I'd like to open this up because I think, you know, it's just uh, obviously, uh, you know, we're in this election season, we're in COVID, we're in climate change, we're in, you know, social issues, you know, Black Lives Matter. I mean, there's all just things which are kind of erupting and, and it can be, it, can, it brings up to all kinds of things. So we need much clarity here and much groundedness about, you know, who and what we are and, and how we're going to enter this world of such disturbance, of such uh, uh, conflict, seeming conflict, with, with this bigger vision of, you know, how can I protect the whole? How can I do the most good? It's like, how can I take sides but never leave, lose the vision of we need to transcend all of this? Right? We need to change everybody. Because even in, in battles of, of the just versus the unjust, it's not as if the, the, the people suffering injustice, they're not as if they're all enlightened Buddhas. With minds, you know, they suffer too. They have anger and fear and greed and selfishness, you know, just like all of us, just like the perpetrators. So we, we have to understand at a deeper level, it's only when that, that is transformed for everyone that all this will finally cease. And so that's the challenge, you know, that's, uh, again, when you enter the world, things get messy, but the practice, the teachings, the meditative practices, I think, give us a way forward, both in the very intimate personal life, interpersonal life, as well as societal. So, I am interested in your questions. Or your challenges, that's fine. And so uh, Maggie's there to uh, please chat in your questions. Uh, so there, for those who don't know, I think most of you know at the bottom of your screen, if you bring your cursor down, there is a chat function. And if you press that chat, a little uh, thing pops down and you just write your question. And Maggie gets the questions and she will then relay them uh, to the hall. So two, two similar questions. Oh, already, okay. For compassionate anger, what would be a good word for this? And are there places in the Buddhist literature or sutras where we can more, learn more about compassionate anger? Yeah, uh, you know, it's, I mean, uh, you know, I, it's often called wrathful anger. Maybe that's another name that may, uh, not, I mean, wrathful compassion. <laughs> Excuse me. And so it, it tends to be, uh, I mean, I, I, I found it more in the Tibetan tradition, tantric tradition, uh, where, you know, as you know, there were, you know, if you look at Buddhist art, you will see these very wonderful, beautiful, beautiful Buddha-like uh, deities. And then you'd see these very ugly, angry, you know, they call wrathful deities, you know, they have like, bulging eyes, you know, they're like uh, somebody enraged, <laughs> bulging eyes, bulging cheeks, you know, they often, uh, you know, have instruments of, uh, you know, torture. I mean, they're, 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 uh, they're wrathful. And then I was surprised to find out that they were considered emanations of these peaceful Buddhas, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Valakiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of compassion, and I forget what, what the wrathful emanation is, but has a wrathful emanation. And the Bodhisattva of wisdom, you know, very serene with this sword of wisdom that cuts through, has a wrathful, you know what I mean? It's like, and so I was very interested in this. And then, so, you know, what is this, right? I, I, I you know, coming from uh, the tradition I came from in Zen, I'd never, I've seen these, and that's where I learned about. They say, yeah, you know, that, that compassion wants to stop the suffering. 
And sometimes one can stop suffering uh, in very uh, peaceful ways. And sometimes one has to be very firm. And that anger is a kind of, you know, it's like sometimes you can say to a child, okay, now, stop that. Don't pull the cat's tail. Not good. Right? And the kid keeps, well, maybe it works. So the kid keeps pulling it. Now remember what I told you, don't pull the cat's tail. Maybe it works. Some kids keep pulling. So when you say, if you pull that cat scale one more time, blah, 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 blah. And the kid really gives the, you know, you know, you know, the, the, the cat a yank. And all of a sudden the parent goes, stop it right now. You see that face? You hear those words? That's compassionate anger. Right? It's, it's strong, it's a, but it's affirming the same principle. Again, some people, You know, respond to kindness, respond to rationality. Right? Some people don't. Right? Right? Some people only respond, uh, you know, when there are clear, you know, negative consequences. And so that's that's true too. And and so that. But you see, that capacity to be wrathful is not the wrathful of egoism. It's not the it's not the it's not the anger at the kid. It's the anger at the situation and the anger at the harm that's being done. That's what we're angry at. And we want to teach that child not to do harm, because that protects the child and it protects the animal. We want to protect the whole, and we don't hate. Anger hates. Anger blames. Anger is personal. This kind of enlightened anger, I don't know what to call it, bodhisattvic anger, doesn't have that. It's, it's really compassion. It, it's, it's, coming, it's not coming from anger <laughs> in, the, in the traditional sense. It's coming from this, this heart of compassion that just wants to stop the harm and wants to restore wholeness, wants to do good. Right? And, and again, if you, anyhow, I, I want to have time for questions, so. A question from earlier. Can you explain the equality complex? Yeah, so, yeah, so again, it's interesting, you know, what is, what is, what is the purpose of practice? The purpose of practice, going back to the Buddha, is to liberate ourselves from suffering, liberation from. And as I sort of talked about it, without going into it, like the uh, verse, you know, the fundamental uh, underlying cause of our suffering is this identification with self, I, me, my, as opposed to everyone else. It's a, it's a complete identification for self. And so what this, this, so this is what this is talking about. May I be liberated from self, but it really talks about the various stances, complexes, that cells take. Sometimes self is what? Superior than, better than, smarter than, righter than, more ethical than, <laughs> better than, you know, you know, the superiority complex. Some people, it's inferior. Everyone's better than me. Everyone's nicer than me. Everybody has more good fortune than me. Everybody, you know, it's like, it's the poor me. Okay? It's, it's, it's the self-hate, self-despise. It's, it's the opposite complex. It's the inferior. I'm, I'm, I'm less than, I'm worse than. But it's still very strong, you see? It's just another complex. It's another stance that self takes. One self says I'm better than, one self says I'm worse than. Then there's this very interesting one, <laughs> the equality one, which is like, I'm as good as everybody else. Right? Yeah, I'm as good as everybody else. I deserve things as much as anybody else. But that's not true either. We're not good as everybody else. You know, 
we don't, we're, you know, we're not as good musicians as everybody else. We don't have the same intelligence. We don't have the same abilities. We don't, you know, we don't have the same talents. You know, we don't have the same drive. We don't have the same, we, we, there are lots of things we, that, you know, we, we're different. So it, it recognizes that this equality as a complex, you see, which means it's something that people hold on to that causes them suffering and comfort of separation. This is the warning. Basically, we, we want no complexes. <laughs> we want no agendas. We really want to be able to go into life without any of this. I'm no better than, I'm no worse than, and I'm really not equal to everyone. I'm just me. And everyone is, is who they are. And it's a world of great diversity and differences because of, because of causes and conditions, because of people's backgrounds, people, people's genetic pool. I mean, there's just so many variables here, and that's just the way it is. This is the complexity of life. And as a whole, when, when we see that as something wonderful and the way things are, then the whole becomes something that we all participate in and then we're happy. See, <laughs> the people who have the equality conflicts are envious, you see? Well, why should they get more than me? I'm as good as them, right? Why, why should they be getting the advance? Why, why, why should everybody be talking to them? Why should they be popular, right? I should be as popular. You see what I'm saying? It's always envious. It's jealous. So we don't like that one either. So that's the mind of the ego of equality. Okay. If this is the world of samsara of suffering, mm -hmm. why should we? Why should we expect it to be any different than it is? How can we think about the world ever being different? Yeah, so, um, right, so this is you know, f f uh, a fundamental view of Buddhist teaching. So it's one of these big views. Samsara is the world of relativity. It's a world of birth and death. It's a world of change. It's a world of impermanence. It's this world in which there's no stability, right? And it's the world of delusion, which means in the face of all that, people are deluded, right? They, they, in this, all this impermanence, they think it's permanence and they seek permanence. <laughs> well, there is no permanence, there's only impermanence, right? In this samsaric world, uh, with all its endless little pleasures, all the little baubles, people are always grasping after them for happiness. And the Buddhist says, no, there's no happiness there, it's just temporary happiness, right? Right. So, so basically, you know, the key phrase in, in, in Buddhism in terms of all of samsara, I'm just talking something that's quite uh, complex into a few words, is that it's, um, it fundamentally will never work. It can't work because it, ha it has a fundamental flaw, which is this fundamental misperception of the way things are. Delusion, ignorance, whatever you want to call it. So that's, that's, from that point of view, samsara doesn't work. And uh, all attempts at making it work within itself, because it, everything is impermanent, everything is changing, everything is arising to causes and conditions, many of which have many, many antecedents, you know, <laughs> there's no stability. And, and, and if you look at the world, you'll see that. Good, bad, right, left you know, dominance, submission, then the, you know, the ones who were sub, sub, submissive, you know, a decade later, you know, they're on top and the other one, you know, it's like, you know, you just see this endless unfolding. Things get better, things get worse. Things go up, things go down. I mean, that's just the nature of samsara. That's what's always going to happen because the nature of the human beings who are living in it. So this is, so this is the world we live in. <laughs> okay. You know, this is the given. But fortunately, enlightened beings, Buddhas, masters, appear in this world and show us that in the midst of samsara, there's a way to understand what's going on and to chart a totally different way in life. And the, and the most greatest message is intrinsically all beings are Buddhas. All beings have this enlightened Buddha nature. They just don't see it and they don't live from it. So, you know, there's kind of, um, 
<laughs> temporary and long-term strategies, right? The temporary strategy is right now, people are caught in this web of delusion and they're endlessly creating suffering to themselves and others. You know, how can, how can I be of help to help beings where they're at? At the same time, in the Buddhist teaching, there's an end game, which is, you know, if people will only kind of learn the Dharma, and, you know, I don't think Buddhism is the only Dharma, but just learn a way to see how to live a life without creating suffering for themselves and others, to lead an enlightened life, then samsara, which is created by human beings, can become nirvana. Because nirvana is not a permanent state. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a story of a Vagateshvara who, who has uh, 11 heads. And the story was, uh, you know, previous lifetime, <laughs> she, she, he, uh, was that made this vow, I am going to liberate every sentient being from their suffering. And uh, she, he, worked diligently. I don't know if there were seven and a half billion people, but uh, you know, in, in whatever realm uh, he, she was in, uh, worked very diligently, one person at a time. And, and hard work. And finally, after I don't know how long a uh, time of effort, finally got to the last one and liberated them. Sort of like uh, in the Bible, you know, on the seventh day, God rested. So, <laughs> sort of like, he, she rested. A job well done. Woke up the next day, I guess, up on a mountain. Looked out over the world. Guess what she saw? He saw. They were at it again. It's sort of like, you know, there they were, out there creating suffering for themselves. You know, it's like. At that moment, she was so despairing because she was attached to outcome. She was so despairing, she sobbed so strongly that her head just burst in anguish. Uh, luckily, there was a higher level uh, Buddha, Amitabha, kind of watching this whole scene unfold <laughs> and uh, came down wherever they, they hang out, manifested, and uh, took all of the various pieces of her head and put it together in a way that she had multiple heads and then gave her multiple arms. Gave her, gave her a heads that kind of could look in all directions, thousand arms that could just, and said, you know, sort of like you've been retrofitted. You can now look in all directions. You have multitude of arms and and ways, just go out there and help. Just go out there and help. But without expectation. And uh, so that's, that's how we do it. Samsara is what it is. It's a world of suffering and delusion. I mean, you know, to me, I, I, I look at what's going on right now, and I think this cannot be any other way. This is just the arising of causes and conditions, historical, they're, they all have roots in, a deluded, in deluded minds. People who are deluded create all kinds of suffering for themselves and others. This is, this is I mean, I understand where I live. And, uh, you know, so hopefully we all will develop that kind of understanding, but it doesn't mean we're complacent. It means, yeah, this is, this is you know, this is the, this is the, the world we're born into. Uh, what do they say? You're either... Uh, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. I think as bodhisattvas, we choose to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So we do our best to transform our own personal, to, to, to free ourselves from all our delusions, all our afflictions, all our wrong thinking, you know, you know, that we can begin right now, developing a good mind, right speech, healthy living, right actions, right? Manifesting that in all my relations, you know, with family and friends, community. And then, you know, you know, if it, you know, when we enter the world, the bigger world, 
in whatever way we do, we, we, we come from that place of, you know, how can I do good? How can I do clarity? But also understand the deeper issue here. You know, it's not just right versus left. That's just temporary. That's just what's manifesting right now. But underneath that, you know, underneath that, the ignorance, the delusions, the anger, the hate, the prejudice, I mean, you know, it's all, it all comes from deluded minds. Minds that identify with self, minds that are afraid, minds that are angry, minds that, you know, need to kind of feel they're better than somebody else. That they're right and others are wrong. I mean, those are, those are deluded minds that need that, that only feel safe or, you know, when they've kind of got these tight, constricted boundaries around themselves. You know, these are, these are beings who are afraid. I don't care how tough they are, how tough they manifest with all their guns and all of this, they're afraid. Only, only fearful people arm themselves that way. Only fearful people act out that way because they're really afraid. And, you know, when people are afraid, they, they don't act rationally. Fear and anger often go very close together. But they want to protect. You know, I mean, this need to protect. So, yeah, I mean, we, we, we need to kind of see what is the deeper, you know, the deeper cause. You know, and again, it all comes back to the Buddha. He said, you know, don't hate the person. Hate, you know, hate the hate. If you're going to hate, hate the hate. I mean, don't hate the hate, you know. Because that's, that's what their minds hate the ignorance, hate the fear, be angry at the fear, be angry at the, you know, you know, the, of delusion, you know. So that's, you know, that's what we need. If we're going to be angry, be angry at these, these forces that cannot be seen and yet have the power to just take over minds. And of course, when you live in a world where that's being fed and nurtured, you know, as we all know, when positive seeds are, are nurtured, positivity grows. When negative seeds are, are nurtured, negativity grows. I mean, that just causes cause and effect. I mean, that's, anyhow, uh, that's just the way it is. You know, again, and we have to be like a Valakiteshvara with our heads, with our multiple heads and our multiple arms. Uh, without attachment to outcome, you know, entering the world, uh, you know, the most immediacy of our own internal world, our relationships, and moving out into the broader world, you know, seeing the bigger picture and only wanting to do good, you know, prevent harm, because a harm to one is a harm to all, you know, suffering of one is the suffering of everyone, and, and that's how we, we operate in this world. So good. Thank you for uh, sharing today and uh, being part of this discussion. You know, I mean, we have to, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh showed us the way of what he called engaged Buddhism. It means a Buddhism that is engaged in the reality of, of the times. Times meaning personal times, family life, work, society. So we have to take these wonderful teachings and practices and bring them into, uh, you know, engage, engage in, in the world. So thank you, everyone. We will stop now.